Hello, uh, on behalf of the Bangalore International Center and the Bangalore Literature Festival, a very warm welcome to World Lit. Uh, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, World Lit is the Bangalore Literature Festival's digital literary, literary platform bringing to you live stream sessions, video interviews, podcasts with leading international and Indian authors. We, uh, the BLF is, is uh, partnering with the Bangalore International Center for this. Um, World Lit was launched a few months ago and uh, we've had some very interesting conversations on the platform with the likes of Pico Ayer, Tracy Chevalier, Anthony Horowitz, Peter James and others. Uh, we are excited about how the platform is evolving and we hope to feature more authors uh, in the days to come. Today, we're delighted to bring to you Around the World in 80 Trees. Uh, Jonathan Derori in conversation with Divya Mudappa and TR Shankar Raman. Uh, I, I have to tell you how we got Jonathan today. Uh, Jonathan happened to pop by and say hello in uh, one of our previous sessions. Uh, and we, got, we immediately invited him to do this session for us. Um, I've been absolutely fascinated by his book, um, which is uh, such an uh, intimate biography of trees um, in some way. Uh, and we have also Divya and Shankar who have an equally fascinating book on the trees of the Western Ghats. Uh, before I hand over to my panelists, uh, you can sign up to our mailing list and follow us on our social media channels for updates. Uh, with that, welcome everyone and over to you Divya. Thank you Raghu and good evening everyone. It's really wonderful to be in this event. And uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Bangalore International Center for inviting us to participate in this event to have a discussion with Dr. Jonathan Drury, whose book we've had for, uh, uh, since it's been published in 2018, we picked it up the same year because we had also published a similar book uh, on trees of the Western Ghats. And, uh, you know, lots of things about this book attracted us, including the cover, because uh, we were actually scoping out for a cover for a book that Sridhar had just written, Wild Art, Heart of India. And uh, the cover of Around the World in 80 Days was so beautiful. And, we, and it was about trees and it had illustrations and it, had, it seemed to have a lot of uh, good information on uh, very fascinating trees from across the world and we immediately picked it up. And uh, then when BIC offered us this opportunity to have a chat with Jonathan, we could not resist it and we accepted it gladly. Uh, but before we take uh, any more time, I'd like to invite Jonathan to talk about his book and his work, uh, after which we will have a chat. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I'm uh, talking to you from the southwest of England uh, in the countryside, an area called Dorset. And uh, it's a, a real honor to be with you, es especially Divya and Shankar. I, I've looked at your book and uh, it really is fantastic. Pillars of Life. Um, everyone go out and buy a copy. Uh, really magnificent work about the trees of the Western Ghats. Um, so I'm going to talk to you for about 25 minutes or so. And uh, then we're going to have a chat and then we're going to uh, uh, sort of have some questions, I think, from the audience. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to start with a very, very short uh, single paragraph uh, reading from just this, the introduction uh, of the book. Most of the book is about individual tree species and the way that human life and uh, the plant science are kind of intertwined with each other about history and science and folklore and so on. But this is from the introduction. Uh, and these trees that you see on the screen at the moment are cedars of Lebanon. One of my earliest memories is of a spectacular cedar of Lebanon near our home. One winter morning we found it dead, its trunk and limbs strewn haphazardly and being sawn up. It had been struck by lightning. That was the first time I saw my father cry. I thought about the huge, heavy, beautiful tree that was hundreds of years old and that I had thought invincible and wasn't. And my father, who I had thought would always be in benign control of everything, and wasn't. I recall my mother saying that there had been a whole world in that tree. And I remember puzzling over that. But my mother was right. There was a whole world in that tree. 
and so there is in every tree. They warrant our appreciation and many of them need our protection. So this is me with my father um, when I was about six or so at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. And you can tell that my father was a, uh, a relatively recent immigrant to, um, to Britain. He came from uh, northeastern Europe. Uh, he, uh, because he's wearing a sort of suit and, uh, and a hat very formally on a, on a Saturday afternoon weekend in, in Kew. And the way that he got my brother and me interested in plants, because that was his real love, uh, was by feeding us bits of them. Now, I don't know if you recognize these two plants, but they're both, um, uh, well, certainly the one on the, on the left of your screen is quite common in India, though it's not native Indian plant, uh, Diffenbachia. And in this country, uh, in England, where I'm from, uh, it comes with a warning label saying, you know, poisonous, don't feed this to children or animals or, or anyone else. And my father gave me a little square of that plant saying it'll hurt your mouth, but there's a very important story uh, to this plant. And the story he told me was about slavery and how uh, in the West Indies, in the Caribbean, uh, slave owners used to feed parts of this plant as a punishment to slaves. And for a nine-year-old, which I think I was at the time, this was a very important story that my father was telling me about slavery, but he chose to do it through uh, a poisonous plant. And he told me about the chemistry of the plant, which has these very fine uh, crystal structure inside that accelerates the poison through the membranes of the mouth because they're like little tiny needles. Uh, the plant on the right, you probably recognize as an opium poppy. And I remember my father giving uh, my brother and me a lick of uh, an opium poppy seed pod um, when, uh, again, I think I was about nine or ten, and telling us about drugs and uh, painkillers and all sorts. And uh, I think the main effect, uh, I mean, I, I had a, a slightly numb sensation on my tongue, it, uh, you know, didn't really do very much. Uh, the main effect was uh, on my teacher when I told her and they sent a social worker around to see my mother. Uh, I remember <laughs> to make sure that I was being properly cared for and not being fed drugs. But it was an important story and I remember uh, this was a way into it through, through plants. Um, uh, my, my career as a documentary filmmaker with the BBC took me to uh, all sorts of places around the world and I was increasingly excited by the trees that I saw, the incredible diversity, the, the wax palm at the top left there that you see in Colombia. Ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous that it can stand up so straight. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm sure you recognize the uh, tree at the bottom, bottom left, I don't need to tell you about that one. Uh, the redwoods on the top right, the, um, uh, the quiver tree, which I'll come back to later uh, from Namibia. Uh, amazing structures. Uh, and incredible diversity. There are the baobabs uh, from Madagascar on the top right, the, the dragon tree from Socotra near, near off the coast of Yemen on the bottom right. Um, amazing, amazing diversity among trees. And I started to wonder, well, what is it that trees need, uh, rather than us thinking of it always from a, from a human point of view? And obviously the first thing they need is water. Um, that's my wife at the very bottom of that very tall tree. Um, and uh, that, that's a coastal redwood. And, and here's an, an interesting coincidence, that if you look at the height of the very, very tallest trees in the world, um, the, the tallest coastal redwoods from California and the tallest swamp gums and the Douglas firs uh, and a few other species, and you look at the very tallest examples of those tallest species, and you look at the fossil record as well, and you look at the tallest examples in the fossil record, and what we find is that the tallest trees that there have ever been have always been about the same height, which is about 120 meters. And trees don't grow any taller than that, um, at least on Earth. And the reason is that um, pumping water up to the top of a very, very tall tree is very hard work indeed. Uh, for engineers in the audience, uh, you'll know how difficult it is to pump water up to great heights. And trees do it, we think, by a mechanism called molecular cohesion um, and, and, and something called the tension cohesion theory. Don't worry, no one's going to test you on this afterwards. But the, if you've probably noticed, if you wear a raincoat during the monsoon, um, little droplets of water cling together and make globules. 
Now, alcohol doesn't do this, oil doesn't do this, but water forms these little globules and it's to do with something called molecular cohesion. It sort of draws itself into itself, it, it attracts itself. And in a column of water up a tree, the, the water can be drawn up from the vacuum formed at the very top of the tree um, when water evaporates from the top through the long column all the way down the tree down to the roots. And if the column is above a certain height, it can't support itself. There isn't enough molecular cohesion. And that means that on Earth, uh, where the gravity is what it is, um, the column can only be 120 meters high. And I love the idea that anywhere in the universe, um, anywhere with the same gravity as Earth, uh, the trees will always be uh, 120 meters max, and that's it. Um, so trees need water. The next thing is that trees need food. Uh, just as we do. And uh, I, I want to ask you a question, uh, and it'll be a sort of rhetorical question because of this crazy Zoom thing, so you can't <laughs> respond to me. But ask yourself this question, a little seed that you see on the left there, that's an oak, oak seed called an acorn, grows into a big tree. And then if you make a bag of charcoal out of that wood, um, you, you've got something that's heavy, right? So the, the, the charcoal is a, is a heavy thing and the seed is a little light thing. So where did all that mass, where did all the weight come from? And uh, uh, most people say uh, it comes out of, the, uh, out of the ground, but I don't know how it is in uh, Bangalore, but in London and uh, in the part of England that I live in, we don't have trucks driving around at night, uh, filling in all the earth that the plants have taken out of the ground. Um, so it can't have come out of the ground. Um, and then people say, oh, well, maybe it comes from sunlight, but um, sunlight doesn't really weigh anything. So how can this weight have come from, uh, if it hasn't come from the ground, it hasn't come from sunlight, where has it come from? And the answer is uh, the air, that uh, what plants do for a living, and trees obviously are plants, is that they take carbon dioxide from the air through their leaves, and they do this fantastic chemical reaction using water that comes up from the roots to, take, to mix with the carbon dioxide from the air, um, do this wonderful chemical reaction to, called photosynthesis that creates heavy stuff that you can kick <laughs> uh, and that hurts when you drop it on your toe. And when we create charcoal, um, all of that is carbon, that's pure carbon. Um, and all of that carbon has come out of the air. Right, so that's a, that is an important thing to understand about trees uh, because when we chop down forests, that has an effect on carbon dioxide in the air, which has an effect on global warming. So that's important stuff. So the thing about trees is that uh, if you look at this uh, view at Kew Gardens in southwest London, um, through your eyes and my eyes, we see beautiful trees. Uh, but to an insect, um, they see lunch. They, they're thinking that could be something to eat. And trees which can't up sticks and run away have had to develop a whole lot of techniques for defending themselves. So they need water, they need um, food, and they need defense. And you can see on the screen lots of ways that uh, trees have evolved to defend themselves. So the, the pachypodium uh, trees of Madagascar have those fantastic spines that you can see on the top left. Um, the uh, uh, sandbox tree with its ferocious spines at the top, the manchineel, which uh, uh, you can find in India actually, um, is poisonous and horribly so. Um, to the top right there, you have oak trees, which are a very familiar sight in parks in England, where I live. And the way they uh, protect themselves is that they contain some tannin, which is uh, rather an unpleasant substance for, uh, for uh, herbivores to eat. Um, but they also uh, have chemicals that sort of um, they create to deter insects. Um, at short notice. So if they suddenly get attacked by a load of insects, they create these chemicals that then waft around on the breeze um, and trigger other trees nearby to create those same defense chemicals. They don't have them stored all the time because uh, they're a little bit um, sort of expensive in terms of resources for the trees to have all the time. Um, and they also send signals, or at least there are, there are signals which can be interpreted by other trees 
um, nearby that get sent either through um, through the air, as I said, or through fungal networks, networks of fungi that connect the trees um, and can, uh, some of these molecules can travel down those networks to other trees nearby, up through the roots and trigger those trees to defend themselves. So there's a kind of communication going on. At the bottom left there, you can see where a caterpillar has eaten some leaves. And this is very clever what the uh, tree has done is that it's created a chemical that will, um, it, it doesn't poison the caterpillar, but it attracts the things that eats the caterpillar. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's wonderful. Um, at the bottom right, you see um, cherry laurel, uh, which contains a two-part poison. So this is something that the military often use, uh, two-part poisons, you have two chemicals that are quite innocuous, um, but when you mix them together, in this case, you get cyanide. And so when something chomps onto the leaf, uh, then it becomes a deadly poison. And the one at the bottom there, that the, you, you, you're probably much more familiar that, uh, with this than a British audience would be, because these are coffee beans, and coffee contains ca uh, caffeine, which the plant uses in two ways. Uh, one is that uh, it does deter insects. Um, uh, most insects don't like caffeine. But the second thing is that it deters other plants from competing with it. So caffeine is a chemical that um, the, the coffee plant produces to stop other plants nearby germinating. Uh, so it doesn't have so much competition. Um, this is a lovely example of defense. Uh, this is the uh, whistling thorn from uh, East Africa. And uh, you, you can see these amazing thorns, but at the, at the uh, base of each thorn uh, is a little kind of round structure, a spherical structure, which houses inside these incredibly um, uh, aggressive ants that when anything uh, comes nearby, uh, like an elephant that would be big enough to not really worry about the thorns too much, they come out and um, uh, defend the tree to the death. Uh, they're, they're very, very aggressive. And the sound of the wind through these thorns uh, has been shown to act as a, um, as a deterrent to, to, insect, uh, to, to elephants. So if you um, uh, play that sound to local elephants, they, they kind of trundle away. Uh, this is one of the images from the book by uh, lovely uh, Lucille Clerc, who's a French artist. And this uh, depicts the cowrie tree of New Zealand. And cowrie trees have uh, another method of defending themselves, which is to secrete a, a resin. Um, uh, lots of trees have latexes and resins and so on. The cowrie tree um, uh, secretes this resin, which over thousands of years fell into the ground in big lumps and uh, caused a, a resin rush. The Californians had a gold rush, the New Zealanders had a resin rush. 10,000 prospectors from all over the world uh, came to New Zealand in the 19th century to um, dig up the resin, uh, which was used for export for, um, for making varnish, for outdoor varnishes. And uh, the, uh, you know, at, at the time, it was the, the biggest import, uh, sorry, the biggest export from New Zealand of, of anything beyond wool, beyond gold. Um, and the New Zealand government was sensible enough to put a high tax on it uh, so that the whole of the modern infrastructure of New Zealand was built on the resin from these cowrie trees. Um, you're probably familiar with another kind of uh, sap, poisonous sap. This is the, um, the Japanese lacquer tree. Again, beautiful, beautiful uh, illustrations by Lucille Clerc. Um, and a, there's a sort of a rather unpleasant and interesting story that goes with uh, the lacquer tree. I, I mean, there's obviously the, the production of lacquer and lacquer objects, which uh, people are familiar with. But uh, there is also a sect of, of aesthetic um, northern Japanese monks who used to drink um, a concoction made out of the sap uh, and that would um, gradually embalm these poor monks while they were still alive. And when they died, they, they were so um, uh, sort of emaciated and uh, plasticized that their bodies wouldn't decompose. And uh, for, for this particular sect, uh, they believed that uh, if their bodies didn't decompose, then when they were dug up after three years, um, this was a sort of path to enlightenment and, and, and Buddhahood. Um, and and the, the practice was only outlawed, I think, in the 19th century. 
And the alder tree, which is very common in Britain because we have so many, so much water here, um, defends itself against viruses and bacteria very, very effectively. And that means that it doesn't rot very well, which is why you often find it growing near water. And the Venetians, um, who built the most fantastic city on, in a lagoon in the, um, uh, in the 14th and 15th century, built their whole city in the lagoon supported on piles, that's that sort of wooden um, rods made out of older wood, which have survived to this day. So the Ponte Vecchio there um, uh, has survived 500 years uh, built on older wood piles. Alder also makes the best gunpowder and uh, because it makes the best charcoal. And so Venice not only had a city built on it, but they had the weaponry and the, um, uh, the, the explosives to put in that weaponry uh, uh, made from steel and gunpowder, um, all based on older wood. Uh, and at the height of their powers, the Venetians could build one ocean-going um, uh, uh, ocean ocean warship, uh, one every day, completely equipped, um, one a day. Uh, amazing. And they did that at a place called the Arsenale, which has given us the word in English, arsenal. Um, so they need defense, they need food, they need water, and trees need to make baby trees. Um, so one way they can do that, I'm, I'm just going to check up on the time and make sure, yeah, all right, another, another uh, five or six minutes. Um, uh, trees need to make more trees. So um, a, in order to do that, they can either do what trees like these, these on the screen, the aspens of North America do, which is to um, clone themselves. So they, they send out suckers, which are little shoots that come from near the roots or the base of the tree, and then these grow into trees. Um, and that is asexual reproduction. In other words, it, it, the tree can just do that on its own. Um, and the advantage of that is it's really quick after a fire uh, to repopulate. Um, the disadvantage is that because all these trees are genetically identical to each other, even though they might not look exactly the same, they're genetically identical. Uh, which means that identical twins are very vulnerable to the same pests and diseases. So this is the problem we have with some banana varieties at the moment. In India, you don't have this problem because you've got the most fantastic bananas in the world and you've got many, many varieties. But over in England, poor us, uh, we only have one variety of banana that's imported from mostly from the West Indies and Ecuador uh, called the Cavendish. And every Cavendish uh, banana is a clone of every other, which means that the fungal disease that is uh, called fusarium that is sweeping the earth, um, we will uh, succumb to. Uh, and so we'll have to find bananas from somewhere else. But that's how, how, you, how trees make more trees asexually. Another way is to do it using uh, pollen, uh, which is then blown on the wind or carried by insects or some other pollinator to where it needs to go. So um, the, the trees that use wind, uh, wind carried pollen are the ones that we get hay fever from. And you, you, you have plenty of those trees in India and they, uh, they give you hay fever just like we have hay fever over here. Um, but uh, that's a, a rather inefficient way of, of pollination because you, you have to create loads and loads of pollen which carries the male sex cells from uh, one tree to another. Uh, you have to make loads of it in the air and just hope that it lands on the female parts of uh, a flower somewhere else. And it's, it's just desperately inefficient. Much better to use a go-between. Um, many plants, flowers, they, you've seen insects buzzing around, they take the pollen from one place to another in return for a reward, and the reward is nectar. Okay, so they get a nice sweet drink, and in return, unwittingly, they take pollen with the male sex cells from one tree to another. Um, it isn't always insects. Um, trees with bright red flowers, insects don't see red very well. Um, so this uh, flamboyant, the Delonyx regia, originally from Madagascar, um, is bird pollinated. Um, and uh, some, some uh, red flowers are, are uh, uh, butterfly pollinated. Uh, the durian fruit that you uh, is more familiar in Southeast Asia, really, um, uh, the, the, the one that really sort of smells quite bad. Um, that is uh, pollinated by bats. These, these flowers are big and blousy, they smell of sort of sour milk and uh, are visited by bats uh, at night uh, who, um, uh, who carry the pollen to the next tree. 
But having created your pollen and made your, your, your seeds, those seeds need to be distributed in order to um, not compete with the mother tree, right? So you need to get the seeds somewhere else. And trees are rooted to the spot, so they have to use something else to take the trees, so uh, to take the seeds somewhere else. And uh, kapok, for example, you can see is this lovely sort of fluffy stuff, um, carries on the wind. Uh, in Europe, we have squirrels, these little kind of, uh, people look at them very affectionately. They're really like rats with, with, tail, with big tails, but anyway, they're sort of cute things. Uh, very common here. They pick nuts, which are obviously seeds for the next generation, and they're terribly forgetful, these squirrels. They bury them, so the plant gets their, even gets the, the squirrel to, to, to bury and plant the seed, which is really clever. Um, the, the squirrels, of course, eat loads of them, but they forget where they put them, you know, so they don't dig them all up in winter. Uh, they've, they've forgotten where they were, and plenty of them come up as trees. And then, uh, sorry, uh, you've got uh, the cannonball tree uh, um, uh, from uh, South America, which is, is uh, you know, you'd think those things just plummet, but actually uh, wild pigs come and distribute the seeds. Uh, birds uh, are very attracted to reds and, and, uh, and, and blacks. Uh, where I am at the moment, top left, these are blackberries. Uh, the hedgerows are full of those. Uh, they're very good for humans to eat, but of course, birds eat them. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and spread the seed through their digestive systems uh, to, to other places. And, and pine cones the same, pine nuts. Uh, you might have wondered why many seeds, uh, many fruits are so laxative, they make you want to go to the toilet. And the, the, this is not by chance, the plant has evolved this way in order to uh, get its, um, uh, it, get the, the, the best possible sort of fertilization for its, uh, for its seeds. So, you, you, you know, an animal comes along, eats the figs, uh, they poo them out somewhere else, uh, along with a little pile of fertilizer. And they're hurried through the digestive system because the digestive system is not a happy place for seeds. So they, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they've evolved to kind of make that process pretty short. <laughs> um, coconuts distributed by water, um, uh, you know, you're, you're very familiar with those and we can see from ocean currents um, that many of the peoples of the world uh, have followed the same currents as the coconuts have, uh, have, have followed. And uh, the uh, one that might look like something that is, um, uh, is, is distributed uh, by water because it grows near water. This is the coco de mer, the largest seed in the world um, from the Seychelles, um, has this extraordinary way of plummeting to the ground, you'd think it's going to compete with the mother tree because this thing weighs as much as a suitcase. Um, uh, but in fact, it puts out a kind of, uh, almost like an umbilical cord and it grows from, uh, you know, it starts to shoot 20 meters away, but, but using the, um, the nutrients from here. Uh, in the 17th century, 18th century, when sailors came across these, uh, you can see why uh, they were regarded as the most fantastic aphrodisiacs. And um, they, they had an enormous price, which in today's terms would be about $100,000. <laughs> um, there you go. Um, and uh, finally, in this section, the, the uh, sandbox tree. This is uh, uh, originally from Costa Rica, but, but I think they're an invasive species now in, uh, in India. Um, they, uh, uh, the little seeds, you can see the size there, they, they um, come out of that seed pod that looks like a tangerine. And uh, when this thing dries, um, different parts of it dry at different rates. And at some point on a hot, a hot afternoon, the whole thing explodes um, with all that sort of energy that's been stored. And these little seeds, which uh, well, you can see the size there, they're like little frisbees. They come spinning out at about 200 kilometers an hour. They'll go 50, uh, 50 meters, sometimes uh, 70 meters, e enormous distance for something that size. Um, and uh, I tell you, if you're, if you're in a grove of these, um, I took that picture on the left at Madagascar, but if you're in a grove of these on a hot day, it sounds like a gun, gun battle going on. Um, the, the, just to, to, to finish, this is the traveler's tree, um, a, a, a remarkable tree that looks like something <laughs> out of science fiction. Um, from Madagascar. Uh, it's called the traveler's tree because apparently you can sort of stick a, um, a straw in the bottom of it and suck water out of it. 
Um, it, it's all full of wriggly things and not very nice, but uh, you know, if you were dying of thirst. And also they say that all these, uh, the fans all align themselves north-south so you can tell the direction. Am I all right for time? Am I all right for time? Yeah, okay. Uh, you can tell the, um, uh, the, the direction apparently by, by looking at the, uh, using it as a compass. Uh, in actual fact, um, uh, this is a joke from Madagascan plant scientists. Uh, you know, they all point in different directions, but they've managed to kid the world that they all point the same way. Um, but here's the thing, um, you know, it relies it, it, on the, um, uh, you know, the, it, it's a member of the family, uh, bird of paradise flower you're probably familiar with. Um, it, it, you can see it's the same sort of structure at the top with these bracts. It relies on a, uh, a very uh, interesting animal to, to spread its blue seeds. Not very many things have blue seeds, but the animal that it uses to spread its seeds um, is one that only sees blue and green because Madagascar has never developed primates that have red like we do. And that is the ruffed lemur. And if anything happens to that ruffed lemur, then the uh, tree will go extinct. And this is the sort of point that I wanted to make really, is that these um, trees, uh, apart from needing water, food, defense, and somewhere to grow, um, in, they need uh, to make baby trees, they need to spread their pollen uh, and disperse seeds, and they need partners to do that. And if anything happens to those partners, um, then uh, the tree will go extinct. And that uh, it, it is incredibly important when you think about climate change, because it's not just about trees adapting to uh, different temperatures and rainfalls, but also all the things that it depends on um, might not be there at the right time if the climate has changed. And so on top of everything, trees need some love. Uh, and I'll stop there. That was lovely. And it's always so fascinating to hear about plants from across the world. Uh, you know, I almost uh, feel like requesting you to go on talking and telling us about more species. Uh, do you know, that, that's a dangerous thing to even joke about, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, what I also liked about your talk is that, you know, it wasn't just about the trees that you have dealt with in your book. But I would like to bring the conversation back a, a little bit to your book, you know, uh, and get some kind of an understanding as to what made you choose these 80 trees. And yeah, uh, yeah please go. Okay, ahead. so, so um, it, do you know, I'd love to be able to tell you a very, very sort of sophisticated algorithm that I used in order to decide the you know, the perfect criteria how these 80 trees out of 60,000 species of trees are the right ones. And um, do you know what? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I, I, I started sort of researching tree stories. Um, I, I was on the board of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew and they have a fantastic library there. And so I just immersed myself in the library. And uh, you know, my first criterion was that I started looking for tree stories that where I thought I had something new to say um, that was, uh, would take some of the plant science and some of the human culture and the folklore and the history and find an angle which was just maybe a bit new. Um, and, you know, that, that's quite hard. So that whittled it down a lot. Yeah. And then, obviously, I wanted it to be around the world. So, you know, there are a few from, um, uh, you know, different, each different part of the world, you know, as, you, as we travel around. So that, that was another criterion. And I suppose um, I was looking for a balance of stories where some would be more scientific, some would be more um, folklore or history, uh, but all of them had this kind of entangled inter interdisciplinary nature, I suppose. Um, you know, I was very pleased when I came across the mad monks of, uh, of northern Japan. Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, you know, while you were actually trying to identify species from across the world, we, when we were doing our book, Pillars of Life, we thought we should be doing something. We, we have so many species here, as you know, and there were some 
some of them that we were so fascinated with and it seemed like nobody was really paying them any attention. So our, our focus was much more narrower and, you know, uh, in fact, mostly within this landscape. And yeah, but, 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 but even then, um, I mean, I, you know, looking at your, your book, um, I think it's interesting that both, both you and I have chosen to, um, to look at species rather than to look at individual trees or to, you know, and I think that people with a kind of sciencey background or a sciencey interest, in my case, um, you know, that's one of the ways that we do that. You know, we, we, we look at, uh, you know, we want to look at the species as a whole. And, and uh, you know, in our minds, perhaps we're taxonomists, you know, we're thinking, how are things related? And, and I, I think that you've managed it beautifully in your book, um, in, in Pillars of Life. I, th I love the way that, um, you know, yes, it's very clearly about the Western Ghats, but it's, uh, you've got a, a lovely range of different kind of plants in there, different trees. And your love of those trees is something that I completely associate with. And I think both our books, the love comes across, that yes. it's not a kind of geeky science thing. There's real sort of a human part of it as well. And I, I, you know, that's why when um, the organizers of this suggested that we three talk to each other, I thought, oh, you know, this is just going to be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. I just uh, wanted to come in, uh, uh, Jonathan. Um, on the point that you just made that, you know, as conservationists, we tend to look at uh, trees as species and we look at species level traits and so on. But uh, even in, in your book and also when we were working on our book, we also got to appreciate many of these trees as individuals. You know, there's this magnificent ficus uh, tree that is towering over a coffee estate. You know, one tree that uh, has a huge impact in the landscape because of all the fruit that it produces, the, you know, the rock bees that live on it and so on. And in your book, you also mention about some particular trees, you know, for instance, this, I think the horse chestnut tree that Anne Frank was looking at from her house in Amsterdam. And there is the, uh, you know, the people tree that uh, gave enlightenment to um, uh, the Buddha. He, and yeah. There are people who have gone and tried to propagate, you know, uh, the seeds or the cuttings from those individual trees as well. And I think even science today is showing that uh, some individual trees have a disproportionate sort of impact, right? Like you have these big mother trees in ecosystem that play a disproportionate role. So uh, I just wanted to sort of come back to that question and say that, you know, as scientists, have we sort of... Uh, ignored or not given enough attention to trees as individuals and that individuals too could matter uh, whether it's in a forest or uh, you know whether it's a tree in a city or wherever. yeah i mean i i, I think it's a really good good point actually that the, there are two aspects to it i think for me one is um about storytelling that uh, you know human beings um really like the particular they like the, 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 you know, the character of the person, the, you know, and, and so um, within uh, the book and, you know, if you're talking about uh, trees to, you know, if you're just talking about trees to the public or to your family, you tend to use specific examples because they can hold that in their mind. So I think from a storytelling point of view, that's a really sort of important thing to do. And then, uh, you know, you're, you, the other side of the coin is the the sort of conservation and science question uh, which is you know you the the um the mother tree idea i think is a very important one and for people who aren't familiar the the the, the thought is or the, the evidence actually is that um within forests uh, uh trees uh, and and many other plants um have a symbiotic relationship with fungi and the fungi create networks underneath the ground. The, the bit of the fungi that we see are just like the fruiting bodies. It's like the apple on the apple tree. Uh, but most of the fungus is below ground um, and uh, kind of plugs itself into the tree's roots. And the tree benefits, uh, well, it can also be attacked, but, the, but in many cases, there's a benefit. And the benefit is that the fungi can extract things from the soil and from rock that the tree roots can't really get very well. Um, and in return, the tree creates sugars and so on from photosynthesis that can uh, feed the fungus. So they both benefit. And the fungus makes this big kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, big uh, network underground. Uh, not only for uh, that can not only carry these nutrients around and actually swap them between trees um, and and even trees of different species, uh, but also can uh, carry information effectively that uh, can trigger trees to create defense chemicals and so on. And the trees with the most connections, the most interconnected hub trees, are these mother trees. And of course, which are the ones that the uh, forest, the, the sort of, um, you know, timber uh, companies will most likely want to extract? They're the ones that are the, the mother trees, the ones that have the, the biggest, they don't extract it for this reason, but they have the biggest networks. They are the biggest trees, the oldest trees for, for commerce, the most valuable trees. And that's a great shame because a lot of other organisms, not just the insects and the, uh, mammals and so on, but a lot of other trees and plants through the fungal networks will depend on those trees, those mother trees. And so that's a, a, a really uh, difficult issue for forest management. Um, and I, I know that you two are, are, are completely expert in this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, this is the benefit of uh, other people watching because, uh, you know, you two are real scientists. <laughs> No, no, not at all. In fact, our interest in plants actually stumped, uh, stemmed from our interest or research studies on either birds or mammals or something. And then we realized that we need to know as much about plants as we would about any other animal. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, once again, going back uh, to a slightly more personal level, uh, is, you know, you did mention that you used to visit Q and then you also later on in life had the... Uh, the opportunity uh, to use the library in Kew. So going back to botanical gardens, you know, that is a, a debate or discussion we very often have because there are botanical gardens. When we go to them, we do enjoy them. But then when a garden is being planned in more recent times, we always wonder what should the goal of the botanical garden be? You know, and uh, because of uh, I mean, again, as conservationists, we are also aware of all the invasive species that have come in from these gardens, like lantana in India and many other trees as well. So what, what is your opinion about botanical gardens and their role in, in conservation or in current uh, scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about uh, the experience in India, but the um, invasive species that we have in uh, in Europe um, and in North America have mostly come through uh, either commerce or um, horticulture, home gardening, uh, these sort of things, not actually through botanic gardens, um, which tend to be, um, in these countries at least, uh, much more responsible and uh, careful about, uh, you know, they bring something in, but, it, you know, they're making sure that it isn't, um, uh, you know, if it is an invasive species or potentially one, they 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 do things to try and limit limit that. Um, so, uh, you know, the role of the botanic garden is, uh, you know, there are several roles. One is um, that, uh, you know, people if people appreciate the sort of beauty and joy of plants, just without any of the science or anything, um, that is a good thing because if people appreciate something, they're more likely to protect it. Now, if they understand it as well as appreciate it, then they're even, even more likely to protect it. So that's even better. And then botanic gardens um, do a great deal of research in uh, how to germinate plants, how to propagate them, how to uh, repopulate uh, areas which have lost uh, lost their f um, flora because of, say, mining or pollution or overgrazing or something. So they're sources of genetic material that you can put back into the world uh, where where it's the right thing to do. So I, I think that there's you know a whole lot of things that the public see about botanic gardens, and then there's all this sort of scientific work that goes on in in the background. And I think all of that is very important. And taken together, the whole network of botanic gardens around the world provides our planet with some kind of resilience um, against you know, species being lost. So there's a whole network of seed banks and some of those seed banks are actually the botanic garden. They're a living seed bank. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, the, 
the uh, concern over botanical gardens has been that sometimes uh, it's in, at least in the hills here, often it's just seen as a place where people go for recreation. I think there's, like you're saying, there's a lot of potential to use it for conservation, for education and so on. And we haven't fully uh, uh, really uh, tapped it. And you know, you also mentioned about uh, how uh, to create greater appreciation uh, for plants and for trees among people. And that if that appreciation can come with better understanding that, and that it's even better. Uh, one thing that's, you know, has been our experience is that when we try to show people something about a tree or uh, something interesting about a plant, uh, a question that's often asked uh, to us right away is, oh, uh, what is the use of this tree? You know, so uh, very often we find that the, uh, the role of a tree is boiled down to a set of uses. You know, it's used for timber, it's used for this. And I think even in your book, you have mentioned how you know, trees have played a, uh, an, 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 an enormous role in human uh, history in terms of all the different uses that people have uh, uh, extracted from it. But is it time for us you know, as scientists, as conservationists to you know, push for uh, a different view of trees, something that's not purely utilitarian and yes. something that recognizes trees uh, for their intrinsic worth? Uh, and if so, how do we go about that? Okay. so. Um, uh, you know, if I was sitting in the same room with you, I would hug you, <laughs> um, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you. And I, I um, uh, you know, what I've tried to do in the book uh, is, you know, look, I know that people are interested in the uses of trees. I, I, I you know, and you have to acknowledge that, that people want to know about the human relationships with trees. And that's, that's fine. It's only natural to, to have that reaction. But I think you know, you can use that as a jumping off point. And uh, if you make the stories interesting enough and, and kind of aha and amazing enough, then people at the point that they know that the tree is, you know, it has a use or a, a story around it that they can understand, they're very receptive to the other things. So what I've tried to do in the book is that, um, you know, where, wherever there's a, yes, there are stories about the uses of, of, of trees, but in every case, I think there are, um, there's, there's a quite a, um, a careful description, a, a, I hope a loving description of the tree itself uh, that would encourage people to really want to look at it. Uh, because when you really, really look at it, you know, if you spend uh, half an hour just looking at a, a plant, uh, you start seeing things in a different way, and it sometimes takes someone else to point those out to you in the way that it would with a work of art. Um, and then you can uh, bring in other stories, which are, you know, the crazy relationship between the tree and some insect or, or a, an animal, um, and the ridiculous kind of convoluted evolution between these, uh, the, these organisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So go, going on to that, you know, one of the things that we felt was a challenge was to capture the grandeur or beauty of trees, right? And uh, working in a rainforest region where we have these towering trees, uh, our canopy height is about 30 meters uh, on an average. And most of the time you don't see the canopy. Most of the time you don't see the fruits un unless you're really looking for them. And most of them don't have showy flowers. I mean, although for us, because we are interested in plants, we would notice them. So we wanted to bring that in our book. And uh, the only way, I mean, after trying for nearly 10 years, we, and then we bumped into Nirupa Rao uh, and Sartaj to really find artists that we uh, you know, came across uh, during our research and studies. And then we said, okay, maybe art is the way to go. You know, uh, photographs are probably not doing justice. So what is it that made you uh, use an illustrator and an artist uh, for your book rather than you know just using photographs because in this digital age there's so much available. Yeah I mean I think uh, you know you could ask the same question about why people have a portrait painted uh, rather than uh, uh, you know a photograph uh, and why if you want to identify fungi before eating them which is a good thing to do, um, uh, you often look at illustrations rather than uh, the photographs. Um, and the, the reason is that a good illustrator can bring out the essence of something um, and leave out the extraneous detail, the extra detail that is just going to be cluttering. 
Um, and a good illustrator can make something that uh, on top of that is sort of beautiful in itself, an interpretation, if you like, that is botanically accurate, uh, but leaves you with a, an emotional feeling. And, uh, you know, if people have an emotional feeling um, then, uh, again, they're more likely to be interested, they're more likely to be engaged, they're more likely to want to protect. And I, for me, I think it's um, very important that the words and the illustration complement each other. So, you know, when I was a documentary filmmaker, the first lesson you learn is don't describe what's in the picture. <laughs> you know, people can see the picture, give them something that is complementary, but not the same. And, I, I suppose in working with the illustrator, I've tried to, I've tried to do that. So that I, uh, the language that I use, um, you know, here and there is, is I've, I've tried to, you know, in, in my small way, be relatively poetic. In other words, you know, to, to create something which has a mood to it and so on, isn't just a, um, a straight description. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope that the, uh, the, the illustration kind of complements uh, so, um, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting job working with an illustrator because if they're not a botanical specialist, I'm sure you found this, um, then, you know, they can sometimes use a little too much of their imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you think, do you know what, that is, isn't just sort of botanically inaccurate, it's the completely the wrong species in the wrong continent. <laughs> but, but then, you know, uh, you, you have a good enough relationship that you can sort of laugh about it. Right. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to um, ask you uh, about another thing. You know, like in your book, you write about these trees, and there are so many examples of uh, sort of a pivotal role that a particular species played in in a in a society. You mentioned about the tree in New Zealand, and you know there are many other examples in the book. And what is it that makes uh, you know uh, trees important for human societies? What can we learn about societies just by looking at the trees? In well, yeah. yeah, sorry, I was going to say, you've, you've, asked, you've asked two interesting questions there, actually, because one is, um, you know, what, what's so important, you know, what is it that the trees give us? And well, you know, the, the trees aren't doing it for our good. They're, they've evolved to either defend themselves with the resins and latexes that we can use or, or, or other features of them that are useful to us for shelter, for food and so on. But there was another question that you asked there, which I thought was very interesting, which was, um, uh, you know, what can you judge about a society from its relationship with trees? And, and I think that's a very deep and interesting question. And I, I think that, um, you know, I think that the way, the way that a society treats its minorities is a very way, is one of the ways that you judge the health of a society. Um, uh, you know, if, if the minorities are being treated well, then probably the society is a healthy one. And I think the same about trees, actually, that uh, societies that, um, look, you know, that look after their trees um, and plan ahead, because, you know, if you're growing trees, uh, then you're having to be thinking a generation ahead if you're, if you're actually sort of, if, if it's a planned thing rather than just protecting an environment. And so, the, you know, um, Victorian England had many problems. But one of the things they were doing was planning ahead with the trees they planted around London. Uh, if you look at the, um, uh, uh, the country of Haiti, Haiti in the Caribbean, they, um, uh, you know, have denuded their forests. And that is, you know, a symptom of something else that's going on about poverty and the way the island is structured and their governance and so on because the other half of the island the, is Dominican Republic and the Dominican Republic is much wealthier and forested and yet they have the same natural resources and a similar population right so it's it, when you look at trees you can tell uh, I think you can tell something about the nature of the society yeah and, um, you know, that's really something for all of us to think about. I'm just going to toss one uh, point there and then, you know, pass it on to Divya for probably the last question. Is that uh, you showed uh, our, uh, uh, the banyan tree in your presentation, you know, that's the national tree of India. And today, uh, across the country, even though there is this, uh, you know, surge in nationalism, we find there are hundreds and thousands of banyan trees being cut 
as our roads are being widened. So at a time in the past, there was somebody who thought and who had the forethought to plant these trees along roads. But today we are losing a lot of those trees. And so I wonder what it says, you know, about our society and where we are going. It's, it's really yeah. Uh, well, look, um, it would be wrong of me to uh, comment about India, um, uh, but I can comment about my own country. And uh, we certainly have that problem here um, that, uh, you know, uh, trees that have been growing for centuries are cut down um, for no really good reason often. Um, and I think there are several things that lead to this. Uh, one is um, a lack of understanding and appreciation, which we've talked about. And another one is short termism. You know, people, uh, whether it's politicians or, um, uh, or people in business or, you know, sort of ge generally society as a whole in this country, in England, where I am, um, uh, there is a sort of awful bias towards thinking just, you know, uh, at most a year or two ahead, rather than thinking about 30, 50, 100 years ahead. I mean, if society was really thinking um, 30 or 50 years ahead about our children and our children's children, you know, we would, we would absolutely not be treating the planet the way we're treating it. Yeah. In fact, we, more of us would be um, enjoying a, uh, uh, an Indian vegetarian diet, which was, it would be one of the things that would make the most difference to the planet because most of the food that we grow uh, as a species um, goes to, to feed animals. Uh, which people then eat. And that is a fantastically inefficient way of doing things, on top of being maybe not very nice to animals. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience who probably typed out their question or are waiting to have a dis uh, you know, direct conversation with you. But before we end, I'd like to ask you one more personal question. Would you ever like to be a tree? And if so, which one? <laughs> well, do, do you know what? I am... Um, uh, I think that's a lovely question, and, and uh, a nine-year-old once asked me this. So I'm going to what I'm going to try and do um, is I'm going to try and share my screen uh, again. I, this will probably give you conniptions, but the um, uh, because I've got. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if I now go to the next slide, how do I do that? Uh, okay. Um, okay. Right. So yeah, uh, so that on the right uh, is me in front of the tree that I would like to be if I was a tree. And this is a quiver tree in Namibia. And you can probably see that it's growing in a desert. And the reason that I would like to be this tree is not because it is the most fantastic, exuberant, resilient thing in the middle of this desert. Um, that tree, by the way, I'm rather close to the camera. Uh, that tree is about 40, uh, uh, sorry, think of this in meters, uh, about um, 15 to 18 meters high. It's a big, big thing. Um, uh, but I'm quite close to the camera, so it doesn't quite show that way. And, but the reason that I would want to be that tree is uh, for two reasons. One is that this is the national tree of Namibia, which means that when anyone sees it, they smile. <laughs> so that's one reason. And the second reason is that um, you, you may be able to see it on the top uh, branches. Uh, it's got a sort of white powdery finish that is actually there to deflect ultraviolet light, but you can't help but wanting to touch it or stroke it. And um, the idea of being a tree that everyone smiles at and wants to touch, I think that that's the tree I would like to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Oh, and if, if people want to get in touch, by the way, those, those are the details on the left. But I'll, uh, I'll go back to uh, stop sharing and then you can see me. Okay. Great. There's, a, there's a lot of questions. We'll, uh, we'll start off right away. Uh, first up, we have a question from somebody who identifies themselves as NP. Uh, they have a tree as their profile picture, uh, which I think is very apt for this conversation. Uh, NP, if you could uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Neha. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. Hi, I found the story when you spoke about how your dad taught you about the world through nature and through the trees. I found that very fascinating and it remind me about my, reminded me of my own dad because he's also a scientist and how he taught me about how seeds germinate and stuff when I was just four or five years old and I always remember that. So yeah, it was very interesting to hear how your dad 
taught you about the world. Um, my question is, what keeps you, I, of course, you have all fond memories from your dad teaching you about trees, but my question is, what keeps you excited about them? And for so long, what keeps you motivated to educate others about trees like every day? Yeah, uh, nice question, thank you. Uh, I think, um, for me, uh, the, the science, uh, the plant science of, of how trees grow, um, how, you know, how they decide when to sprout a branch um, uh, or, um, uh, you know, sort of just what shape to grow in, the, you know, the ecology and all that is fantastically exciting. But the, it's, for me, it's the combination of the tree and its relationships with other species that is, is the most exciting thing. So I, I, I love hearing about and then telling other people about the, the relationship between um, trees and insects, trees and giraffes, trees and, and uh, you know, the, 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 and trees and human, people, uh, human beings. You know, the, the, uh, one of the trees in the book is, the, is very familiar to you, I'm sure, the nim tree um, uh, of India. And, uh, you know, the, that, that story about how the nim tree um, manages to cope with pests and disease and uh, has chemicals in it that disrupt the life cycle of insects is really interesting. But so is the story about the, the human attempts to make um, uh, to make pesticides out of that chemical and, and the, the, you know, why that has uh, either succeeded or failed and so on. Um, and then uh, around all this, you have the fantastic folklore that goes along, along with the neem tree. Um, you in India, of course, are familiar with that, but most people around the world would, would not know about the neem. <laughs> yeah. Everything's gone rather quiet. Sorry, I, yeah, thank you. It's so interesting. My dad actually <laughs> did studies and did research on the neem, neem tree and sequencing the genome of neem. So interesting you mentioned that. Uh, okay, well, the, 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 we're obviously telepathic. Right. Divya and Shankar, are you there? Uh, still? Question from Amulya. Amulya, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. It was really, really interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you know, in recent years, there has been this uh, explosion of books where trees are the protagonists. It may be something like, you know, uh, Peter Waldman's The uh, Secret, uh, you know, Life of Trees, or even yeah. in fiction like, um, you know, Richard Powers, The Over Story, which was great. And something like even in India, Sumana Roy's How to Become a Tree, which was again, a fascinating sort of a work. So why do you think that there is this explosion of, you know, trees as protagonists? Is it has to do with the kind, the time we are living in? Um, I, I just want to hear uh, from you about this. Um, do you know, uh, you know, if I was a politician, I'd obviously make something up and sound very authoritative about it. But, you know, actually, I don't know the answer. Um, I, can, I can guess, uh, but my guess is probably as good as yours. I, I think that maybe um, it's a sort of a, a reaction to the short termism that uh, I spoke about earlier, that people see trees as a kind of uh, something a bit more permanent. Um, uh, I think also that at a time when the values of our leadership, um, uh, I'm certainly talking about Britain now, and uh, I wouldn't um, profess to talk about India in this light, but it, the, the leadership that we see, for example, in the United States and Britain, um, uh, in terms of values, leaves something to be desired, I think. And I would say that, uh, you know, trees uh, may be seen by some people as, uh, you know, they're, they're at worst neutral and in many ways positive as a, uh, as a sort of uh, you know, something that we can regard with a kind of permanence and a, and a good effect on the world. Um, and there's also this uh, feeling that they have quite complex relationships, uh, which, um, you know, I think people want to anthropomorphize, even though we're probably wrong to do that. Um, but in a way, it's easier to anthropomorphize with trees than it is with, uh, with other plants. So I'd say it's some combination of those maybe, but I'm no expert. Thank you. Up next, uh, we have a question from Vivek Shah. Hey, Jonathan. Uh, Mind-blowing session. Like all the facts that you shared, 
were like totally eye opening. Uh, my okay. question is a bit of an extension of the botanical garden example. Is what are your thoughts on sort of like globalization of trees as we see skewed deforestation around the world? What if we had these plant, trees planted in similar environments around the world to maintain their diversity? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we have to be quite careful about uh, taking plants uh, or any any species actually from one place on the planet to another, um, because it might feel like it's a very similar environment, but actually the the ecosystem that has developed in one place, um, uh, you know, even if it's a a rainforest uh, or or a desert, which might seem very similar to another desert or another rainforest actually the ecosystems will be rather different. And if you start introducing uh, new, new species, um, you know, you can really upset the balance because uh, first of all, there might not be the organisms there that will um, uh, you know, spread the pollen or, um, uh, or, or disperse the seeds, or worse, uh, in which case the, the tree would just go, go extinct. Or, or worse, there might be uh, no competition for it and actually it spreads out of all control. And we see this in quite a lot of places on the planet where you have a species which is actually um, you know, quite well managed in one place, uh, like the water hyacinth, for example, um, in, in, of the uh, sort of Orinoco and Amazon um, uh, river deltas. Uh, where you know that that's, that species is held in check by uh, a complex web of insects and other things that sort of eat it and stop it spreading too much, but when it uh, was um, arrived via the Belgians in Africa, um, it just completely uh, sort of took off um, and and became and is still one of the most important invasive, most destructive invasive species in the world, even though the actual habitats that it comes from, you might think, are rather similar. Great, thanks. Uh, up next, we have a question from uh, Saraswati Ganapati. Uh, hi, can, can I be heard? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hello, welcome. All right. Thank you. That was an absolutely marvelous talk and lots and lots to think about. Uh, I was thinking about the whole link between mythology and religion and trees. And that could be several volumes of a book of books, I would imagine. I was wondering whether you have any favorite ones. Um, uh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so, so there's one that I like. One of the things that I like is where the mythology reflects the science in some way. And uh, I'll give you an example. In Germany, um, there's a saying that lightning never strikes a beech tree. So beech trees are very common in Europe. Uh, I don't know how familiar you would be with them in, in, uh, in, in India, but they are a sort of big woodland tree with very smooth bark, uh, sort of gray, gray bark, rather sort of um, dark woodland because nothing much grows underneath them because they filter out the light very effectively. But there's this uh, story that lightning never strikes a beech tree. And the interesting thing is that lightning strikes beech trees just as often as any other tree. And there are, but there are lots of these folklore stories in Germany about lightning and beech trees. What happens is that lightning strikes a beech tree, um, but it doesn't damage it. And the reason it doesn't damage the beech tree is because during a storm, there'll be water, uh, rainwater, and the rainwater provides a film down the trunk of the tree. And because it's so smooth, there's a continuous film down the tree that acts as a lightning conductor and the lightning travels down the outside of the tree through the water um, and down, down to the earth without damaging the tree. Whereas other kinds of tree with craggy bark where there'll be dry bits in there, um, even during a storm, the lightning gets rooted through the tree and causes the damage. And so, so that's one example. Uh, another one in, uh, that we have from Europe is um, willow trees that uh, um, contain a chemical which is the precursor of aspirin. So you use this chemical to make aspirin. And a lot of folklore um, uh, from the Middle Ages uh, around this tree is that if you take a little sliver of the bark and you put it, if you have a toothache, you put it into your gum, just a tiny little piece. And then the, the story goes, if you take it out and put it back in the tree, 
the pain goes with it. So you can see that there's a sort of combination of this interesting kind of um, you know, folklore explanation of the world of taking the pain and putting it somewhere else, but it has a basis in, in scientific fact, which I really like. Fascinating, thank you very much. Thank you for your question, Saraswati. Great, thanks. Um, up next, we've got a question from uh, Mukunda Krishnaswamy. Mukunda, if you could uh, go ahead and ask your question, please. Fascinating discussion, very insightful. Your passion for trees remind me of uh, James Cameron's admiration for ecosystem and trees in the movie Avatar. Yeah. Uh, really admire what you're doing. Can you talk about uh, a little bit about how trees age and do they have distinct life events? Oh gosh, what a fantastic question. Uh, <laughs> I've never been asked that. And we, we might want to go to Divya and Shankar who might have a, um, uh, a, an expert view on this as well. Um, I, uh, you know, yes, there are life, uh, life events, uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, growing as a sapling, um, reaching maturity where they can create seeds uh, or, or, you know, be pollinated and have flowers if, if, if they're those kind of trees or cones, um, and then, then create uh, seeds um, and create the next generation. And they can continue to do that over a certain kind of length of life. Um, trees have, uh, you know, different tree species have different life, you know, um, different uh, sort of um, lengths of lives. Uh, you know, we, we know that, that the bristlecone pines um, of California uh, can live thousands of years. Uh, there, are, there are some other pines uh, of Northern Europe that do as well. Um, uh, tropical trees tend to have a, a sort of slightly um, uh, shorter life, um, but you've got the coastal redwoods and the sequoias that, uh, that can also go more than a thousand years. Um, the, the sort of other life events, um, I, uh, you know, you do have some trees that have a completely different juvenile form from the mature form. So they sort of, they, they, their morphology, as we call it, their shape, uh, the shape of their leaves completely alters after a while. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering whether, the, I can't think of things that sort of outside that, that happen, you know, to uh, a tree between the sort of ages, but once it's mature, and then uh, as it gets towards the end of its life. Divya Shankar, can you think of um, uh, rites of passage or, or, or whatever? Yeah, there, I mean, the, the tree that immediately comes to mind is the jackfruit, the, which is a native species from India. And um, when it's a sapling, it, it, like you said, it looks completely different. The leaves are lobed. And, you know, when, when it becomes a, a large tree, the leaves are smaller and look like, a, you know, an entire leaf rather than a, a lobed leaf. And you can see those changes as the, as the trees grow. You know, as rainforest uh, uh, ecologists trying to learn plants, we often grapple with this because you pick a leaf from a small plant in the understory and you're trying to identify it. Often it looks very different from what yeah, yeah. It would be like uh, when it's a huge, you know, canopy tree. So, that's... so M M Mukunda, I'm not sure we've exactly answered your question, but we've had a go. <laughs> um, we'll take a question from uh, Pratima Rajshekaran next. She has a question for uh, Divya and Shankar. Go ahead, Pratima. Hi, uh, thank you so much for letting me ask this question. And Jonathan, your um, enthusiasm is really infectious and lovely listening to you. And Divya and Shankar, um, like I liked what Divya said about um, like the purpose of having all these botanical gardens and like how we go about constructing all these botan botanical gardens and are we giving enough thought as to what goes into these places? So um, one thing that um, so got me thinking about is like all these campaigns that support, you know, um, like tree plantation as means to uh, like conserve water and all that. Like how, how um, like effective is this? <clears throat> I mean, like, do you have any thoughts on just like, are trees going to be the answer to water con conservation or are there other kinds of plants that can 
Uh, I, I think uh, from our experience and understanding, we feel like I think Jonathan has already mentioned, we really need to be aware of what species go where. So uh, in fact, uh, it is very worrying to see how in our country, we've been going around planting trees as though that is a solution <clears throat> for everything. And we are probably losing some of the much more endangered uh, habitats like grasslands and species that are associated with grasslands or arid areas, you know, like desert. Uh, I, I hope someday you'll uh, look up uh, Pradeep Kishan's talks about the arid zones of India and the specialized plants of those regions. And those plants have adapted to conserve water in whatever environment it is in. And I think therefore it is very important that we are aware <laughs> and very sensitive to what we plant, be it in a botanical garden, be it in restoration efforts, uh, be it in uh, climate change mitigation or whatever. I, I really do not think that trees are an answer for everything. And we really need to be very, very uh, uh, cautious and uh, sensitive and uh, also uh, knowledgeable or whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah in, in the Western Ghats where we live, where there is some research which shows that if you plant the right native species in the right places, it can be better for water conservation or hydrology as compared to say, uh, alien species like acacias and eucalyptus and so on. But in, uh, in, in the dry belt, like Divya mentioned in grasslands and so on, planting trees can have a counterproductive effect. In, in fact, due to high evapotranspiration, it can actually reduce the water table there uh, at the same time as destroying a fairly unique ecosystem. So which species go where and uh, is something that we need to pay a lot of attention <coughs> to, whether it's a city or a forest. Great. Uh, we've got a question from Nicole Beliapa. Nicole, if you could go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for teaching us so much about the trees. Uh, it's really wonderful. I have a question about, I mean, taking the example of the sacred trees in India, who are so many, I mean, there's so many trees uh, everywhere, uh, removing it from the religious uh, part of it, I mean, not thinking so much about the Hindu uh, uh, rituals uh, around them. I'm just uh, often thinking, about creating those um, sacred spaces for trees, especially in cities, so that people um, take more, you know, acknowledge more the, the trees and um, yeah, consider them, appreciate them, honor them in their own ways, I would say. But uh, with that example of the, the Indian sacred trees, and I would, of course, it would be for any kind of trees who have become special because of their age or because of so many things you have explained today. So I wanted your point of view on that. I'm not sure if I'm very clear, but- Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, I, I, I think you're, you're very clear. And uh, <clears throat> I think that there are some um, scientists uh, or people with a science training who uh, kind of react rather badly against religion and, um, and sort of folk culture and superstition and so on and, and uh, I, I find myself um, uh, you know I, I, have, I think I have a different attitude to that I think that, that human beings need different kind of inputs we're all different in that way um, and one of the things that I've noticed is that where there are strong religious or superstitious um, reasons uh, you often get a much better protection of the environment um, and it's not always the case <laughs> But there are some really nice examples. So the baobab trees that I showed right at the beginning, um, one of the reasons that they've survived in Madagascar is because uh, the, the local story goes that the ancestors of your, uh, your ancestral spirits, the spirit of your ancestors lives in those trees. And that means that people don't chop them down. Now, if that's what it takes for people not to chop the trees down, then fine by me, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a good result. And um, the idea that there are either sacred spaces which are, um, you know, connected to a religion or just spaces that are, um, have a kind of, uh, that we feel have a sort of spirituality about them or satisfy uh, a human need, which is not necessarily exactly logical or rational. 
uh, I think is, is, a, is a sort of nice and good thing. So uh, I, would, I would absolutely encourage those uh, in, in the countryside and in cities. Just wanted to quickly add that there's a lovely book by uh, Harini Nagendra called Cities and Canopies, which talks a lot about this, uh, which you might also be interested in looking at. We have uh, time for just one question. So for the folks that, whose questions have not been answered, uh, our ask would be, uh, please do engage with uh, Jonathan on Twitter, Facebook, or email. Uh, I'm uh, we're sure he'll be happy to respond. Uh, we'll take Absolutely. a last question from uh, Bhupati Srinivasan. Uh, Bhupati, if you could unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Yeah, we know. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is very similar in the sense how to create the relationship uh, between the trees and humans in a big way, um, apart from religion or uh, is there you know, uh, case studies that you have seen while writing this book that, uh, especially in urban space, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, it's a question we ask ourselves a lot in England because um, if you go to Germany uh, or Central Europe, there is a real sort of feeling that the soul of the nation is in the forests. And uh, obviously, I, I, I don't know enough about India to know where the soul of your nation is, um, if it's in one place or, or not. But in England, I think if, if there is any soul in the nation, then it's probably in the sea. In the, it's a maritime nation, a maritime history. And uh, getting that kind of emotional connection uh, that the Germans have with trees in a British audience um, is, is very difficult. And one of the ways that we found, which is um, uh, quite effective, is to try to get every child to plant a tree um, through the school system. So Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom to the, to the, to the west of the country, um, uh, that have some of their own laws and things, they've managed to contrive that every child will plant a tree. Um, uh, and it, it started with a, a tree would be planted for every child, but now children in Welsh schools go out and plant trees. And uh, we have charities in this country, uh, in, in England, uh, that uh, really try to um, get schools involved and plant trees. And then they take the kids back every few years to see how their trees are doing. And, and that way you have a connection with the, with the trees. Um, so I think uh, the key is probably starting with young children. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan uh, and, uh, and Divyan Shankar uh, for such a fascinating and moving conversation. I, found, I think I found kindred spirits. And uh, Jonathan, it was a heightened experience hearing you speak after having read your words. Um, uh, thank thank you. you for that. Uh, and we give our love, of course, to Tracy from Bangalore for, you know, for making this session uh, happen. Uh, thank you again, and thank you, audiences, for joining us this evening. And thank you so much to you and to Divya and Shankar. Uh, I'm really, I, I hope we can meet at some point. We've got yes, a lot to talk about. Yes, so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.